Hello and welcome to our preview show ahead of tonight's game against Bristol City. I'm delighted to be joined by Sky Sports reporter Michelle Owen and Stephen Chicken from the Huddersfield Examiner. How are you both? You okay? Yeah, good, thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Um, obviously, games are coming thick and fast at the minute, Michelle. I mean, the, the Championship is unpredictable at the best of times, but it seems like it's even more so this year, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just mad, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, look at some of the results they've been. Um, obviously, looking from a Bristol City perspective, who I, I cover a lot and do the podcast on, they started off so well, and you, you did feel it was a bit of a false position to start with, um, especially, you know, with the teams you'd expect, like Watford, Bournemouth and Norwich, yeah. when, you know, they weren't flying high straight away. Now you're starting to see, I guess, a regression to the mean where, where, they, where they are. But you still get results each weekend, you're thinking, oh, wasn't expecting that. And anyone that tries to put an accumulator on each weekend, I don't think the championship is probably the worst thing to bet on. <laughs> so unpredictable. Um, but that's what makes it exciting. And, and I think more so than ever this, this season, and I know we've seen it in other leagues as well, the Premier League, but it's, it's exciting and it keeps it fresh, doesn't it? So, yeah, don't ask for any predictions today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's always uh, it's always a, a difficult league as as we know, and you know anyone can beat anyone, and all the other cliches you want to bring out. But as you say, this year it's it, it seems to be very sort of congested. Um, there's obviously a few teams at the bottom who aren't doing great, but other than that, you you're looking at a lot of teams who see much of a muchness in terms of of the results. And weirdly, sort of contrary to the Premier League, we've sort of we've looked at this before and I need to run run the numbers again. But in the Premier League, it's so unpredictable because there's so many goals. But in the Championship, it seems like it's unpredictable because there's so few. There's actually like fewer goals than you'd normally expect, or at least there were when I ran the numbers a few weeks ago. So we're seeing that small differences can make a a, a big difference in terms of the results. And I wonder how much the the fixture schedule has to kind of play in that. Obviously, at the minute, it's been Saturday, Tuesday or Saturday, Wednesday constantly for a month period. I wonder how much that's had an impact on teams. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, I'm sure it must do. I mean, you're going to get more inconsistency and, and it, it sort of it, it levels the playing field a little bit um, because everyone's sort of got tired legs and even the teams that are sort of more you'd normally expect to be uh you know in good form or putting things together in terms of of tactics or or technique when you've got tired minds and tired legs those those levels will inevitably drop and and it has a bit of a, a leveling effect yeah absolutely and i think yeah I'd, I'd like to ask one of you if you know the answer to this. And we usually played this many games by this point because we've started later. We started a month later, but they are squeezing more in, aren't they? We're having more yeah. midweek. I know we normally have a lot of midweeks in November, but it does literally feel like they've had every Saturday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And also, some some teams are getting a bad schedule, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen to every team at some point. But some teams are playing on a Tuesday and playing on a Friday, or or playing on a Wednesday evening and playing at a Saturday lunchtime. And that's hard. And that's that's tough going. I know it's. People say it's their job, they're professional footballers, but the fatigue is going to come in at some point, and the teams that haven't rotated as much are going to have to now. Yeah, so um, I'm just looking now, and sort of this time last season, the first nine games were um, were spread out over pretty much two whole months, whereas this season it's been over. Um, less than two less than two months it's been sort of like seven weeks so yeah they have had to fit a lot more games in and obviously they've still got the international break as well um and i think there's nine games is it in in december or eight games in december coming up yeah um plus the new year's fixture so um we get the international break and then it, it just goes uh it gets really busy again. So the other, the other thing I've noticed is that we've, we seem to have had quite a lot of uh, red cards up and down sort of the divisions in the EFL uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, certainly there were a lot at the weekend and in the championship there were um, a lot the previous weekend. Obviously Naby Sar was, was one of them. And I think that's partly the weather, but I also think it's partly, you know, again, tired legs, players chasing back, not quite getting to the ball um, and, and more mistakes happening. So everyone needs to be at their best and, and keeping the concentration up, I think, is the main thing. Michelle, obviously, Bristol City, 
they haven't won in five games since the last international break. I wonder, obviously, like we say, with the fatigue and the, and the schedule, how much of an impact do you think that has had on, on their run of form? Because they were excellent prior to the first international break. You know, it was so good before, before the first international break. And I think Bristol City fans were understandably getting excited, even though it was really early days. Change of manager in the summer. Dean Holden took permanent charge. And um, I talked to him about it at length. And, and he said, I was like, look, after this international break, again, it's, it's a lot of fixtures in a short amount of time. What are you going to do? And he said, oh, I don't like to change a, a winning side. And he does like to stick with more or less the same team. But more than fatigue, I think with Bristol City, it's been injuries. Um, and, you know, every team gets injuries, so it can't be a too big an excuse. Um, and they have had a couple of things not going their way and a couple of penalty shouts and things like that. But again, that happens to every team. But they aren't getting much luck at the moment. They've lost um, Andy Vyman, who you, you might look at his stats and think, oh, well, he doesn't actually score that many. And his assists aren't that prolific, but he runs all day. And he, they moved him slightly deeper this season. So then the field has been upset by that. And they also lost Alfie Mawson two weeks ago. Um, I think he's done his knee. So they're without two big players there. And they've had to rely a little bit as well on on players that started playing last season, like Taylor Moore, but they're prone to mistakes, you know. A massive mistake against Middlesbrough cost them at least a point um, when Taylor Moore was just caught on the edge of his box, tried to play out from the back. And it seems that every, every championship, and I've done championship and League One games this season, and pretty much every team I've played plays out from the back. Uh, every team I've watched plays out from the back now. Yeah. But when we're saying there are this many games, then there are going to be momentary lapses. And if the other opposition are on it, on that moment, then we're going to see it happen. I don't know about you, Stephen, but I've seen so many near misses as well in the last few weeks. Like uh, I was watching Swansea at the weekend and a sloppy back pass to Freddie Woodman in the goal and um, Adam Armstrong from Blackburn, he closed them down. He was on him like that. And it's almost like the strikers at the moment know if they're on it in this weather with conditions as they are, if the defender slips or is just a bit sloppy, then then they're in. So I don't know if there's something to be said for being a little bit more careful about playing from the back because it's cost Bristol City at least, I would say, at least three points so far this season. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, I mean, we saw in the very first game, uh, Richard Thurman did that that back pass and, and that ended up letting Norwich win. So that's at least one point. And there's, there have definitely been near misses. Um, Lewis O'Brien ended up running back towards his own goal because of a, a poor touch at the weekend and that almost let uh, Millwall in for an equaliser. Thankfully, Naby Saar got, got across to to make the tackle. So it was, uh, yeah, I mean, Town of, of we've talked about it on this show as well before, the fact that, that Town are, are playing that risky approach, playing it out from the back and it comes with with risks, that approach. And But at the same time, we saw that goal on Saturday against Millwall, that first goal that came from from Ben Hamer. And it's not the first time that Town has scored a goal this season that started with the goalkeeper and then built up and, and ended up in a goal at the other end. So that is why they're doing it. And thankfully, so far, Town have got more points out of that approach than they've lost. But you're right, that there, there, there has been an element of, of luck for Town, I think, that, that a couple of those other moments that they've had and, and lapses that they've had haven't been punished in other games. The, the balance with that's really interesting, isn't it? Just to find the the, the right way. Because like you said, Steve, obviously at Huddersfield Town, it, it's benefited us in a number of ways this year. Obviously there was that, the one back pass um, that, that led to obviously Norwich's winning goal on, on our opening day. But for, for Huddersfield Town this season, it, it's been probably one of the strengths in terms of the build phase because Hoggy's been dropping, dropping deeper. We've had Carol Iting dropping deeper as well. And ultimately then it allows us to create different spaces. It does. Uh, although there is a, a balance to be struck there. I think there's probably been times where they've they've actually dropped a little bit too deep and they found it difficult to find that link between um, sort of the dropping deeper allows you to find the link between the defense and the midfield but then obviously you've got ground to make up between the midfield and the attack and I think that's where Lewis O'Brien is particularly valuable because he's such a good ball carrier and and again at Millwall we saw that plenty of times and I I thought but I thought they got the balance um absolutely spot on against Millwall um it's you know it's 
it's probably been my my biggest sort of criticism and the thing I was starting to get a bit concerned about was that midfield balance but to be fair I thought they were absolutely bob on um at the weekend and Jonathan Hogg in particular uh in the middle was was superb I thought everything everything good involved him at some point and you know he was in well he was obviously involved in the move for the first goal because every, every all the 11 players were but if you watch um if you watch the third goal as well, he plays sort of that key, pa- that uh, quick pass forward and that Fraser Campbell touches on for Bakuna to set him off running towards goal. So, um, yeah, there's there's opportunities there. And it's just finding um, the right mix, I think. Michelle, you'll be able to tell us, did, did Dean Holden kind of introduce that more playing out from the back when, when he started permanently? Um. No, Lee Johnson used to do it a fair bit too, but Lee Johnson could, couldn't seem to decide on a formation, especially like towards the end of his, his reign, I suppose. Um, he didn't always used to play wing back. Some play, sometimes he played four at the back and he used to chop and change a lot and he changed teams quite a lot as well in terms of selection. Whereas Dean Holden now, he's, he's stuck with this system with, with the wing backs. I know a lot of teams are playing wing backs. I think every team I've seen this championship, probably bar one, has um, played wing backs this season. So he's he's stuck with that, and he's got options at wing back. But in the main, he's stuck with Jack Hunt and and Tommy Rowe, um, who you say are sort of probably safe pair of hands, but they can get caught a little bit. Um, they're not that sort of spectacular going forward, but they can. You know, Jack Hunt popped up with goal at the weekends, and and they can bomb on and, and make those decisions. But they brought in Jada Silver against Norwich at left back who who I really rate, but he's had a few injury problems. So um, they're, they're, they're players that, you know, can play, you know, sort of five-yard passes out from the back. Um, Lee Johnson did used to, like, play some really nice playing football, but in the end, it just wasn't really clicking. But I wasn't at the Norwich game because it was 12.30 kickoff at the weekend. But from what I've read and what I've heard about that game, Bristol City just weren't quite clicking in the midfield. Um, they yeah. had Chris Brunt holding, who... We all know he's a sort of veteran now, isn't he? Um, because he was resting a young lad called Tyreek Bakinson, who's coming to the Bristol City team this year, and he can play some lovely football. So I'm not, I'm not overly familiar with how they played on on Saturday because I wasn't there. But they had a, quite a lot of shots, and they had, from looking at the stats, they had okay possession, they had 44 percent. But they brought in Callum O'Dowder, who Bristol City fans I think love to hate because they had a bit of a thing with his contract. Um, a few months ago where he wasn't going to sign. He did sign in the end and he gets a lot of flack and they've brought him into sort of the central midfield three because they haven't got Andy Vyman um, and they're just really missing those links because Andy Vyman would just play a simple pass, you know, and then run again and, and make the space and, and a selfless player really. Whereas O'Dowd and Patterson are a little bit more flair players. Yeah. So maybe with that passing style, they're just missing that sort of, well, in my opinion, they lost that that level headedness in the summer by letting Corey Smith go. And from what I understand, speaking to Dean Holden, I'm not all that sure he wanted to let him go. So um, they've lost that sort of calmness. And I guess that's why he's been trying Chris Brunt. But they can play some really nice football. And, and they're, they're OK from set pieces as well. You know, they've got some tall defenders in there that, that can get up and probably should score more goals. You know, Thomas Callis is, is pretty good with his head. Um, and Zach Viner sometimes comes forward from the back three and can whip in across. So they have got options. Um, but yeah, the, the problem recently as well has just been not taking chances. You know, from Irish East, you had a massive one against Bournemouth. And OK, you can't score all, all your opportunities. Of course you can't, because if not, you'd be playing in the Premier League, wouldn't you? But he, yeah, he was in for Chris Martin and, and he didn't do brilliantly. And then at the weekend, Narky Wells misses a penalty. You know, so I would imagine what, what Dean Holden is saying up at the failing training ground this week is they've got to take the opportunities. And and they conceded three goals on Saturday as well. So there's a lot to work on. Um, more than just start a play, I'd suggest at the moment, to be honest. Naki's someone that obviously we know very well at Huddersfield Town. I mean, what what kind of... How has he fitted into to Bristol City's system? Obviously, he, was, he joined in January... Uh, last year and he's had more time to kind of develop and, and fit into his role now 
I think um, everyone was really excited when he joined. You know, that had a great goal scoring record coming from QPR, it was then, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I don't think Lee Johnson was quite sure how to play him when he was in charge because should he put him with a big man up top or, or should he play him sort of as a 10? Um, but with Dean Holden, he's playing off the, the taller striker. So he'll either have Chris Martin there with him or he'll have Famara Zizou. Uh, he doesn't normally play a smaller attacking player with him. And um, he's done okay, but I don't know why he's been on penalties, because he's missed six of his last nine penalties. And he tried a uh, Panaker at the weekend, and he chipped it over the bar. So, you know, and, and at that point they were losing. And you're thinking, just put your laces through it and put it in the corner. But he's popped up with a few goals. When I've seen him, you know, he, I, if you watch him, he, his movement is good, and you know all about him. And you feel like if he has good service, he'd score a few more. So I wouldn't want to weigh too heavy on him because I don't think he's had the opportunities in the last few games. He was building quite a relationship with Chris Martin in those first games before the international break, and that was quite exciting. And they couldn't be absent from the team, but since the international break, they just have not clicked again. I saw Nucky Wells. Uh, I remember he missed two in a game for Town once against Fulham. Uh, at a game I was at, so he's never been particularly great on penalties. I, w- I would suggest. It's on him. Yeah. I don't, no, one will, then... no one will forget his um, penalty final uh, penalty though. That, That's that, true. That That's was true. the one that I think Huddersfield Town fans it will just ring in their memory constantly because it was the, an excellent spot. Kick. The one that really counted. Yeah. To yeah. be fair. <laughs> yeah. To be fair. No. Uh, yeah. It's. 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 The most clinical finisher in the in the championship last year. If you look at his stats, so um, it is. I think with him, just a way of of getting him in, and and Town found that as well. That if you create chances, he'll put them away. But um, respectfully, I'm not sure he's a player that's gonna create a lot of goals out of nothing for himself. He is a you know an out and out striker in that way, and and they'll be relying on on the midfield and 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 the fullbacks to create opportunities for him. So. Uh, they're a really streaky team, Bristol City. We were just saying before we started the call, and then we realised we should save it for for the show. But they, Bristol City, over the last few years, they always seem to either be on like a ten-game winning run or like a ten-game uh, winless run. What's what's that about? I thought I thought it was Lee Johnson, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he's gone, so we can't say it's Lee Johnson. But yeah, it's, it's incredible. It just seems. You can't even say it's all the players because the players are different than a couple of years ago, you know. And, and okay, you've still got some of the same players, but Chris Martin wasn't there, you know. And and he had um, he, he was playing brilliantly before the break. I think he'd got uh, three assists before the break, and those assists were often helping out Narky Wells, like you say. And he, he was getting the service, but since the international break, I, th- I just feel like it came at a terrible time for them. Um, I mean, yeah, every team had it, but it's just since then, I don't know what's happened. I mean, they've, they've had the injuries, but I look at their squad and the players that have come in just don't seem to be clicking. And we mentioned Callum O'Dowd there, Jamie Patterson before the, before the international break was playing brilliantly. I don't know why they're so streaky. If I did, I'd probably be their coach. But, um, <laughs> and they've got, I think they've got a really bad record against um, Huddersfield at your place as well. So, yeah, they, they, I mean... It was probably Town's most dominant game last season, um, was the Bristol City home game. Of course, the worst performance of the season was the away game at Ashton Gate. So, um, but yeah, I mean, they they won 2-1 in the end, but it, it really, it should have been like 4-1. The XG was the highest Town have had for years, I think. It was, it was pushing four goals in that game. They absolutely dominated Bristol. So, um, and from speaking to, to Gregor McGregor, uh, the the he and I are the best two names in regional journalism. I think. <laughs> it's two um, names. Yeah, from speaking to Gregor McGregor, who covers uh, Bristol for, for the Bristol Post, it's um, uh, that was probably their worst performance last year as well. Mm. So, um, but. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, we we always talk about this, and it, I know it's a uh, it's a a bit of a bugbear um, uh, of a couple of people at your end, Adam. Just this idea that 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 will be weighing in in players' minds um, because you know it's not like it's not like Pippa or Carolitan will be going up, oh, but they uh, they battered them in in January. So um, yeah, exactly. so yeah, I mean, Carlos has been 
at great pains in his in his press conference to say that you know every every game is its is its own thing and and basically finding new ways of saying it's uh, it's one game at a time and <laughs> and all of that but yeah it, it's uh yeah it's uh, it's back to zero once the whistle goes i suppose yeah, absolutely. And, and Michelle, obviously, you mentioned that, that, that Dean Holden hasn't always been reluctant to make changes to, to his starting eleven. Even in these fixtures with the, them coming thick and fast every, every week, do you think that's having a toll almost on the way he wants to play, the, the style of football, but also the people on the periphery of the squad, maybe knowing that they might not get a chance or they're not really in his head? I think he's had to make more changes in the last couple of weeks, especially with the injuries as well. He rotated the, the front two and and from Arjiz who came in, he didn't deliver. So you, you can argue that he has done it more recently. Um, I think that's one of the big challenges, isn't it? When you go from being assistant coach to head coach, you were the go-between before. So you were the one keeping those players happy. So whereas he used to be that, that man that can manage those relationships. Now he's the one having to make those tough calls. So it's a really difficult transition for him. Um, but he's going to, yeah, I, from Saturday, I'm, I'm almost certain he'll make changes. But then his hand is forced a little bit by the injuries they've got. And they, I know they've got a few niggles and things as well, um, which Gregor was talking about earlier on his, um, his Q&A that he does on Monday lunchtime. So it's... Um, it's difficult for Dean Holden because he hasn't got everyone to call on that he'd like. Same for many championship teams. But, yeah, he's going to have to start switching things up a little bit more. But some of the players have played almost all of the games. Jamie Patterson's been pretty much ever-present. And, um, you know, he's he's their creative spark a lot of the time, but he's not been that sparky, for want of a better word. So, yeah, like like we said at the start, all, all players are getting tired now, so he's going to have to utilise the squad a bit more and he's going to have to manage those relationships. Um, Chris Brunt is someone that came in and started the last game instead of Tyrick Bakinson. They might switch that back, I think, this game. And whether Canem O'Dowd gets the nod again. He's not. He's more of like an attacking midfielder for me. So when he plays in that middle three, I'm not sure how useful that is. Um, I think he works hard. I like O'Dowd and I think he's got some some sort of brilliant tools in his locker but he's a bit hit and miss so it'd be very interesting to see who he goes with tomorrow night when they go again at the weekend oh, well friday they're playing they're playing friday the seven side derby so they have been a bit unfortunate with the turnaround of games yeah th- this is one one area where i think carlos gorbrand thankfully is, is has had has been able to benefit because there were five changes against Millwall and and he has rotated the team and and uh, and tried to keep players as fresh as possible and Town had a lot of injuries sort of at the start of the season and we saw you know like Sir Romney Critchlow coming into the team and the bench to be perfectly honest was was not as strong as it it could have been I think there are probably more B team players on the town bench than they would have liked in the first few games but. Uh, apart from sort of Danny Ward um, and and maybe Romani Edmonds Green, that the bench has been about as strong as it could have been over the last the last few games, and um, I I think this is a season where talking about you know knowing your best eleven and playing your strongest eleven, it's just not going to happen for so many teams because because of that fixture pile up. So having those options and being able to rotate players and and keep different legs fresh and having different options is going to be so important and it was good to see on Saturday that that Tam were able to make so many changes and and come away with probably their best performance of, well definitely their best performance of the season the the only sort of um i think the only sort of new issue now is Alex Pritchard who who Carlos has said is definitely going to be out of the game um which is a shame it's he's did not add much luck with with injuries, Alex Pritchard, and it's, I saw the injury happen. It was sort of right in front of the press box, and he just sort of slipped while he was making a tackle and, and rolled his ankle. And it was like, oh, that immediately you could see, oh, that that could be a, a nasty one. That's at very least going to swell up. Um, so we'll see what the extent of that is. But obviously, he's definitely out of the game um, against Bristol. So. I think that's a shame because he, he probably had his best 45 minutes um, he's had for town for certainly since I've been, been, you know, in this job. So, um, but it's a chance for, you would think Carol Lighting might come into the team or perhaps Janino Bakuna, who 
who came off the bench and, and looked good again, had a really good performance in that second half, got two assists, although Colin Murray was laughing at the fact that the first one was an assist because it was a square <laughs> ball on the halfway line. Um, but no, I, I thought Backer coming off the bench looked a lot better than he has done on a lot of his starts recently. Um, so it's whether Carlos now wants to wants to go with Backer after, on the back of that strong performance or whether he goes with uh, with Carol Lighting instead because he obviously you know uh, didn't didn't get on the pitch. He didn't need to use him um, at the Den. So there's options there, which is a positive, and and I don't think there's any there's I don't think there's a team that he could put out where he'd be like, what's he doing here? Because um, everyone has, has played well in at least a couple of games this season. I'm sure you'll agree with this, Steve, but I think uh, in terms of his selection, it will be really interesting whether he matches up Bristol City and, and goes five or three at the back, whether he goes for his 4-3-3, his favoured formation, uh, and then if he does do that, whether he starts Naby Sarr and Christopher Schindler, what happens to Richard Stearman, who was probably uh, man of the match in the, the two games previous, what he does with the, the middle of midfield, who he starts out wide. Obviously, Adama Diakabi came in and, and performed, performed uh, well, obviously, uh, at the weekend. So there's so many interesting questions and players that necessarily weren't in good form or weren't in his mindset or supporters' mindsets, probably more more perhaps, but that are actually now coming to the fore and, and making a stake for a starting spot. Yeah, it's been a bit of a theme this season that we've seen players who the fans were not big fans of um, have have uh, really redeemed themselves. Ben Hamer was another player at the weekend who, who I thought had a, an excellent game, better than the seven I gave him in the play rating. So I'm a bit of an apology for that. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he didn't put a foot wrong. And I think, I mean, we talked about him recently, so I went to work well on him too much. But we talked about it with Clem. But, you know, he came into this season. I don't think many fans would have particularly been enamoured with the idea of Ben Hamer playing in goal, whereas now I think they're, they're reasonably happy with that, actually. Um, Isaac and Ben's just another player who you see him in the team now and it's fine. Like He's he's uh, he's another player and it's not Wise and Ben's are playing anymore, which it, it would have been last year. Um, D is an interesting one because obviously it was the, the Bristol game um, in November last year where that was his last game before he uh, he was dropped from the squad and ended up going out on loan. So, if he does play, it's a it's a real opportunity for him to make a statement and a, a fitting occasion for him to to continue his redemption because he got a lot of stick um, after that Birmingham game and and you know I don't think he played great against Birmingham, but I don't think it was anywhere near as bad as people were making out. And uh, and you know he had a decent game and got an assist at, at Millwall. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, as I say, it's doing a, a predicted lineup is a bit of a fool's errand at the moment. I think if if Bristol play what what we can be fairly sure of is if Bristol do play two at, at the top, then Town will probably play a three because the philosophy and the approaches that he likes to have um, man for man marking plus one more in central defence. So if it is a two from Bristol, it'll probably be uh, a three for Town. So it's possible it could be a a a, a three five two um or a, or a three four three but who knows as i say try to guess at the moment is a bit of a fool's errand yeah it's absolutely anyone's uh anyone's guess and michelle obviously th this match bristol city like we said earlier i haven't won in, in five games how important is it for for them just to find and get that winning feeling back before obviously what is another important game a, a derby for them on the friday week so yeah, Friday's massive, a seven-side derby. Interestingly, both of those games have finished 1-0. And the last two fixtures, and the side that lost got rid of their manager. Not to say that I think Dean Holden is in any danger yet. But <laughs> they just need something on the road on uh, tomorrow evening because it's just a horrible, horrible one. Though. Sorry, I have, a, I have a little one that's just popped up. This is what, I think it's what everyone is like working from home at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's... it's it's vital, isn't it? It's for any team, you know, to be on that, that losing or that streak without a win is, is horrendous. And they're doing so well before the international break, and there was so much optimism. 
so yeah, they, they need to get something tomorrow night, but I'm not feeling particularly, particularly confident for them. Like I said earlier, terrible record um, against you at your place. So if they if they can get a point, I think that'll be a bad thing. And then they can at least take something into Friday's game. I kind of had a mixed start to the season, but um, they're difficult to play against. But yeah, you've got some real quality in your in your side, and it'll be very interesting to see who he goes with, particularly midfield. I think he'll probably stick with Chris Martin up front, whether he brings uh, maybe Antoine Semenyo, he might give him a chance. He was a young striker that's been at Bristol City and come through the system but he's quite you know he's quite a big sort of tall striker would they work together that's where Naki Wells offers some difference to Gigi as well so he's got decisions to make across the pitch you know right from the back three or five you know a couple of them you'd expect Callis and Viner but the rest of it you know that's very interested is um is anyone's guess really um because you just feel he's got to change something and I, he won't change. I'd be shocked if he changed the system. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be personnel. Um, but if they can get something from the game, I think they'd be happy with that just to stop the run. And, and Steve, just finally, from a Huddersfield Town perspective, what, what do you expect to see from Carlos Corber on the side? I mean, everything we've, we've, we've come to expect. I think although the, the shape might change and the personnel might change, the, the, the approach doesn't from game to game and they'll be looking to play on the front foot to dominate the ball to ask questions of Bristol City I think <laughs> famous last words but it's it's probably a um, a game that suits town a little bit in a similar way to, to the way Millwall was town seemed to have done um, done well against teams that play a back three because that tends to mean that you've got um, a counter-attacking mindset and town have done well not just even before Carlos Town were at their best when they were playing against teams that would that would counter attack but um yeah and and that would come at them and, and give them opportunities to, to counter attack so hopefully it'll be an end-to-end -end game um because I think that that would suit Huddersfield Town um quite nicely yeah absolutely um Steve Michelle thank you very much for joining us uh, Huddersfield Town fans uh, you can watch uh, tonight's game on I Follow HTAFC. It's free for you if you're a season card holder. If you're not, you can purchase a match pass for £10. Thank you very much for watching.